Welcome back to the Narratives in Philosophy podcast. This episode was done in a very impromptu fashion, so we didn't have much of an introduction, so I thought I would just record one uh, and inserting the front here. The episode is talking primarily about the book club and the new directions that we're going to take it, um, focusing on the production of material rather than consumption of material. Uh, if you are interested in this uh, conversation and the uh, philosophies and psyches uh, behind this new direction, feel free, listen on. Not all of the books that we go through I find to be benefiting the areas of the psyche that I want to grow in. And so, on the other hand, if we flip that around and say, okay, what if we produce things rather than consume things, I say, yes, I, I could produce anything, even if it's a topic that I don't necessarily need to learn very well myself. Mm -hmm. If I think it's something that could be beneficial to other people, of course I want to produce that. And so that's where it all starts, producing. Production, so you know, you think of the three levels of uh, cost as levels of questioning. You've got the bottom, you've got uh, define, describe. Second level, you've got processing questions. Yeah. And then the third level, you've got uh, off the page. So we're really taking it off the page. So I thought about Trivium, and I thought about how that was kind of posed as a a class, a course system, a classical education enhanced sort of thing, and thought, well, this is this is along similar enough lines. Why don't we bring it in? Why don't we call this some sort of uh, positive perspectives trivium? And let's the the vision was basically that we communally produce the content that we would want, high enough quality content that it could be on the book club. Sure. That we would ourselves maybe see these videos as um, as good courseware, as, as an alternative to the books we've been reading. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the courses will probably have to be based upon some primary and secondary and tertiary source material. So, you know, we will still be reading. Yes. What's interesting about this that is, is the it thing. even more responsibility, and that's, that's the one worry I had. Absolutely. Was that there will be some people who will probably be even more disillusioned with this. And we are waiting to see the fallout from that, I think. Yeah. Th that's exactly my, my thought as well. Yeah. As far as research is concerned, I do research every day as part of my school. So it's not something that You're is not doing. daunting to me. You're already doing it. It's not daunting to me either. It's what something is... on the side I can yeah. do a bit of and we can have a, you know, a better a better In the initial production. meeting, it was daunting to me, but I had a bit of a come to Jesus last night around midnight. I was staying up uh, listening to Victor Davis Hanson teach at Hillsdale College mm. on the World War II campaigns. And it was good teaching. Yeah. It was just good, solid teaching. It was, uh, you could tell he knew all of his primary, secondary, and tertiary sources so well that it's not just him reading a slide or staring at a map and pointing at things. He's telling you a story. Yeah. That was really inspiring. Absolutely. So that night, I thought of a thing Stephen said, we will all pick our vices. And I said, well, as it says at the end of Ecclesiastes, beware, my son, of the making beyond these, for much study is a weariness of the flesh. I was like, if I'm going to weary my flesh in some way, <laughs> am I going to smoke, drink, or read philosophy? I decided, I'm going to read philosophy. That's your vice. So I threw all my cigars out last night. Oh, wow. <laughs> So I've, I've dedicated myself... <laughs> so funny, dude. <laughs> I've dedicated myself, as of last night, to the oh rigors gosh. of study. So I'm ready to that go. Is, that is so Brandon of <laughs> you. It is such a mean It is such a Brandon. <laughs> uh, but here's the deal, man. Like, yeah. It's more beneficial than some of the other things I was spending time doing, and... Everything we're doing seems to be vanity anyway, so if I need to pick something that's a smaller degree of vanity, and if I'm going to be wearied in everything that I do, I might yeah. as well weary myself in some noble cause. And this seems to be noble. But Sounds about right. A couple other questions came to mind. Is, you know, you have Masterclass, a program that's advertised on YouTube. You've got a, a several, yeah. And, uh, and then there's... Especially uh, nowadays. There's another one. Academy of Ideas. Hmm. Um, is on YouTube as well, Crash Course, all of these things are really high production value, educational things. Some of them are even subscription-based. 
So my thought was, how do we make ourselves different from these other programs, Crash Course, yeah. Masterclass, Academy of Ideas? I think that's fair in one way. It's also kind of uh, self-deprecatory in another. If you look at the book clubs in and of themselves, I've gone back and listened to several of the recordings this week in preparation. They're more real, authentic. They are... They're different. They're fundamentally different. Absolutely. Effectively, what all of the other... Um, well, maybe not all of the other. What I should say is there's an institutionalized educational system. And those master classes, those high production value things... They go inside that They system. follow those. And they follow those for, for good reason. Effectively, they're hiring professors. They're hiring well-educated men who... Like Degrassi Tyson or something like that. Who have who are part of that system in some way, that intelligentsia, that public, you know, university system. Yeah, and you know, that that is something that I, I agree with you wholeheartedly on because what I what I think makes the book club so singular in this marketplace, if you will, is the personal element, the interlocution, the discussion, the lively debate. Uh, when and you... I think as much as that dies, yeah. the book club dies. I... The, very likely. And you know, it's not even necessarily the books we read. That's very informative we as well, yeah. Towards it has nothing to do, do with what we read almost. It's are the people going to get together and have a discussion? Yeah. And that's so rare today. Like, that was how we started. I was listening to our very first video last night. It was such a meme. Uh, our 23 minute introduction to positive perspectives. Yep. And I was like, you know, that summed it up. People are trying to have discourse through Twitter. And it's not working. So people want to have discourse on other things. Yeah. So that was the thought. Is how do we keep that discourse element in, in this new, new format? Yeah. How do we do that? We, we'll definitely talk about that. I think that's really good. Because that is part of what differentiates us. I think there's maybe maybe at least a couple of discrete elements there. There's this element of of almost that podcast format where you do have this real discussion going on. And that's something that's absolutely organic to us. It's not like we're forcing that. Even True. like even like the master even like the narratives and philosophy podcast where we kind of do with each other for so long and it just kinda of happens. So there's that element. There's also this element of re examining primary sources with fresh eyes. And this is a concept I've had in mind for a long, long time. Back when I mm-hmm. was more of a serious Bible scholar than I am now that I'm in seminary. Um <laughs> that look. <What? laughs> That's another topic that we look. need to put to the side and discuss. Yeah. Um, what happened there? <laughs> I, I, I held as this ideal, this concept of examining the text with fresh eyes as something that was extremely valuable and um, worth something. It was worth working out the meaning of the text wholly, fully, working through it myself before going to commentaries, before going to the processed mm. um, the form composite yes, of another man. Of, of <laughs> thousands of others. Yes. And so I think that that's kind of the essence of this, this book club thing that we've had going on as well. We go back to those original sources. We each read them. We each interpret them. We each come to that club with thoughts and, and new ideas about what these texts have, have what they meant, what they brought to us. Yeah. that aren't stained by thousands of years of history in some cases. See, that's exciting, but to my ears, we've moved on from that. We've moved into a new era where that is not necessarily going to be what happens. We have, yes, and the, what I proposed is that we no longer bind ourselves in that way. Hmm. My hope is that we have grown wise enough to where that restriction is no longer necessary. Sure. Just like nowadays, I wouldn't hesitate to flip open the commentary. Sure. I absolutely wouldn't. Whereas back then, I absolutely would have. Hmm. Um, I think that that's where we as philosophers have hopefully gotten to where we have established ourselves sufficiently sure. enough that we're not going to be arbitrarily swayed by, oh, this is the popular opinion. Hmm. We this should is, just follow that. This is Matthew Henry's interpretation. Yeah. Even though it's probably a good one, because he's Matthew Henry. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. I really think we have sense. grown. I think we are ready to acknowledge, oh, there's secondary sources. Oh, there's even tertiary right. sources that we can use as reference. So there's some other topics, and this is all, this is why this can probably be a sidelights episode, because this is something we really need to 
discuss, the concept of discussion. I had a discussion recently with a, a fellow, if you will, who shall not be named here, he's a very fine fellow, and essentially there was the expression of the idea that conversation cannot bring people together and that some differences between ethnicities, people groups, different religions, yeah. different personal, personally held beliefs will never be surmounted towards the aim of building a unified society. So the proposed medium for surmounting that was conversation and he was rejecting that. And in that that's the thing. I feel that is a rejection of positive perspectives at the most principal I agree. assumption level. Absolutely. So my thought was how do we respond <laughs> to that? that? Yeah. And how do we counter that, not in a mean hearted way, but how do we counter that in a way that shows, hey, this actually is good. An example that came to my mind as I was listening to Victor Davis Hanson teach last night yep. is the relationship between Joseph Stalin, Churchill, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Like, let's just look at these people for a second. Roosevelt is this leftist, socialist, all the way to the point of Stalin might not be that bad of a guy because he's about the people, my man. That's Roosevelt. Churchill, as he said, is, quote, a relic of the 19th century. <laughs> believes in the British Empire. You know, I love that. Has a, a room full of cigars. Yeah. You know, like the dude drinks whiskey from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to bed at 2 a.m. And it's safe to classify him as a conservative as well. He's a conservative's it's conservative. It's safe to classify him. He thinks that the conservatives shouldn't be conserved. That's how conservative he is because they're too far to the left. So there you've got Churchill, you know, he's got the Chancellery, Chancellery of the Admiral, Admiralty or whatever it was called. Um, he, he led in World War I, he led an attack on Tripoli, there was a disaster, it was his idea. But you know, all of this, he's like, he loves this stuff. He, he lives, eats, sleeps and breathes this. Meanwhile, Stalin is watching the beginning of World War I, I mean World War II, when he's got this uh, treaty with Germany and watching Germany and all of the non-communist powers destroy each other and he's loving it. Somehow, all three of these people come together. And there's probably many different opinions on how that happened. Maybe it just happened because, quote, fate brought them together. But I mean, like, what, <laughs> what does, does that even mean? Yeah. Fate brought them together. They, they came together because they needed to come together. That, that doesn't give us good enough of an, a reason. Uh, because of mutual economic benefit. Well, all of this presupposes conversation. They sat down in Iran um, at one of their first meetings and had a conversation. They sat down near the end of the war in Britain or New York, I forget, or on the Potomac, I forget where, and they had a discussion and they planned how this was gonna go. And somehow they stayed together when and I don't think that the argument that they just needed that to happen is enough. And if you want to say that, fine. We need to discuss today. Right. Like, look at the world. So I don't know. That, that's my argument. But maybe you can come up with something else to tack on to that or something. Yeah. That's to... not so much an argument as it is a, a quintessential example. Like, what yeah. you've provided is basically an extreme, you know? Sure. A very extreme example of how, of the power of conversation and, and its use, its function. Um, I mean, fun sure. fundamentally, I've had a, a philosophy for a long time that it's really just in relation to Christians, but it's maybe good enough for this example, or for this purpose, that any um, sane, like psychologically sane Christians, given enough conversation, can come to an agreement about absolutely anything. Hmm. And so the premise here is each person in their minds are built up by what I'll call experience hmm. and experiences. And these experiences can be conveyed in conversation. And so this is where most people would attack the argument. They say, no, experiences can't be. I'm saying, yes, they actually can be given enough time. Hmm. So I'm saying that the medium of conversation is actually expressive enough to convey experiences. Hmm. 
And if this is true, that's just highlighting the, the whole, yeah. the, the, the purpose of conversation here. And so when I say they can agree about anything, I'm like, okay, if, if one person's experiences are flavoring their views towards one particular side, and a different person's experiences are flavoring to the other side, perhaps given enough exchange of experience between them, they will both understand where they're coming from. Like, this is very common speech now. Where, mm -hmm. where are you coming from? How did you get to that conclusion, you know? Yeah. And, and actually understand each other and, and thereby come to some sort of agreement. Whence, whence came you and whence go thou? Yeah. Well, so then there's another thing to tack on to this that just came to mind as you were saying that. One of the assumptions that prevents this from being possible is the assumption that blood, and that word is chosen very specifically, blood, ethnicity, blood and iron. I could get to that, yeah. Whatever you want to say is the thing that sets people against one another and that because you are of a certain blood, it's in your DNA that you will be unable to work with someone, someone else. else. So, now, so that's the thing. It's taking it beyond the Christian. I can't. Okay, so that was my old philosophy. This is something yeah. that I've had for a long time. Almost no one agrees with it, and so I've just left it there. Well, it makes sense to me. So well, at least one of us. Here, I agree. With you. That's nice. So take it beyond that, then to people. In yes, general, to people in general. This is the hard part. This is yeah. the hard part. So, um, where I go, where I have to go here, is something along the lines of the image of God. Hmm. Now. This is taken from Genesis, where uh, God creates man in his own image, and effectively instructs man to bear God's image. And what this is meaning, in a very simple way, is to say that God as creator over creation puts man as ruler over creation to point back to God and say, like I rule, so God rules. Mm. Like God loves, so I love. Like God is, so I am. Mm. And this is effectively the spiritual quest, the motif, the actual uh, essence of what it means to be human by a Christian worldview, mm. and shed so much light on our desires, on our thoughts, on our, on our beings. And if you are a Christian, and if you hold that Imago Dei in all of its theological weight, you could very easily agree that conversation to some extent can bring people to some commonly held ideas. If you aren't a Christian and you don't believe that, we have a little bit of a problem. But from my perspective, it doesn't make a reality less true. Even mm. people who don't believe that they're made in the image of God actually are. They actually are. So it can still occur. <sighs> no. <laughs> no. I mean, it's, uh, it's it not can still come together to some extent. I mean, I, I say yes, but it's not that simple. Um, the reason I beat this problem so hard is because this seems to be the cornerstone of positive perspectives. Yeah. And I was very surprised to hear it questioned um, recently. But it explained a lot. It explained a lot to me as to why uh, it's difficult for unity to be reached because people are losing faith in humanity yeah. to some extent. Absolutely. I mean, a symptom of nihilism. So, so go on. You were saying something there about yeah. how, how that looked. Okay, so how it looks, I still put a lot of weight on given enough conversation. Given yeah. enough time, yeah. And I think that this is where the disconnect happens because, yes, given enough time is a very difficult requirement. It requires two parties to actually give it enough time, give it enough conversation, Deliberate. actually listen to each other yeah. for extended periods of time. And so I think my argument is still sound to the extent that I could say, given enough time, any two sane people can agree about anything. I can remove Christian entirely from the argument. The hard part there is that two people starting from, let's say, different sides of a culture war or whatever it may be, aren't going to give each other the time of day, much less a minute of their ear or their, or their speech. Hmm. And so I, my statement holds, given enough time, but... How are we going to actually enact that exchange of time? And that, that seems to be the linchpin upon which positive perspectives turned, was that if we can maintain the bipartisan or what have you uh, mode of thought enough, we can effectively bridge the gap by providing positive perspectives 
perhaps. So if you provide positive perspectives, the left and the right need not be so divided. Yeah. Hmm. Well, because you're providing images of things that whatever party may be actually desire. Hmm. Yeah. And so they will come together towards that end. That that is certainly the ideal. I mean, there's definitely, you know, your absolutes in there. You have things that probably both sides will hold without shifting in any way. Like, I don't think many people on the right would ever have their mind changed and, you know, the proverbial louder and prouder. A fetus is a human at conception. Change my mind. You know, the whole point is you're not going to change his mind. It's a meme. <laughs> then on the other side, you know, there is systemic racism inherent in America. Change my mind. Now, that's the thing. I People hold these things, but is it possible to get them to hold those things in such a way as to not demonize one another? That's the question. I don't see that happening. That's a, that's a different question. That's a different question entirely, because at least it is yeah, it's sure. different from my framework, because my framework says we actually have to agree about the reality about truth. We'll get to this in another Sidelights episode, What is Truth? And it's such an important question because you actually aren't going to agree. You you will demonize each other unless you agree about what is true, what's real. Hmm. Do you think positive perspectives has had much consensus? I know for me, my big theme from day one in positive perspective was the theme of truth. On my big page was the question of Pontius Pilate, what is truth? Um, then everybody else had some interesting quotes as well. One of them I remember was, uh, the human brain is unwilling, unknowingly ignorant of everything, or something like that. I probably butchered it, you should look it up. Yeah. Oh yes, good old Eliezer's second. The human brain is hardwired to assume everything that is not known, i.e. everyone is unknowingly ignorant about nearly everything. But I don't know that, so I'm ignorant about whether we're ignorant or not. Uh, okay, so what was yours? To push against the limits of finite reason. And I will say, I wrote that when I was 11 years old. Ooh! <laughs> oh, man! Get wrecked, noobs! <laughs> Barton's was a quote from Chesterton about leaving a white post alone and how it may need to be repainted. Yes, indeed. Good old Chesterton. Okay, so... That, based upon that, that's like the outward-facing storefront of each person's real estate. Is there consensus in positive perspectives <laughs> on the nature of the thing we claim uh, to have as a foundation to help us actually do anything in the world? We have to have consensus on this if we want to do anything, or if we think it's doing worse. anything is valuable. Okay, so it's worse than that. Oh, no. Not only... Do we have to have a consensus about truth? Anyone who we want to co-converse with, consume and receive content from, we, we might say in internet terms, has to have that same foundation of truth, or we're talking about different things. Or at least be willing to change their Engage definition. in that, yeah, maybe, maybe they're just going to engage in our definition of truth. And this is something that's implicit. It's not necessarily um, explicit. So... I think in positive perspectives, positive perspectives, we have had an implicit, people call it worldview, um, understanding of reality, truth that undergirds our conversation. It's been implicit. Our explicit discussions of truth, absolutely not. We're all on completely different pages when it comes to what is real, what's true, what's what is a word. I mean, our consensus is very much lacking. You can see it by the actions of the group. Like some of us believe that human action is so useful that we are doing things all the time. Some of us believe that our actions are so vain that there's very little being done, at least observably. Uh, so that has been an interesting problem for us to face and that is one of the big questions for me going into this new year of positive perspectives, is if there is not a consensus in that point, 
no matter what we do, whether we are just doing our survey class all the way up until Peter Berger or whatever, or whether we're doing class formations on logic or rhetoric or political theory, none of it will matter because we don't have the consensus and agreement that what we do matters because it is integrally connected to our beliefs about truth, our epistemological ideals. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. What's, what, what say you, Sir Jacob? Well, Is that too bleak of a picture? It's tough. Um, I think maybe we shelf that, we continue working on that in narratives and philosophy. And, yeah, this like, 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 like we are right now. <laughs> um, uh, for the purpose of this episode, perhaps we do continue to discuss what our vision is for uh, Trivium, what our actual, actual points are going forward. And yes, this is basically discussing how we're hoping that other members of Hot Perspectives will be involved in this. Yes. Um, we've identified some perhaps lacking foundation. And yeah, I, to, to be quite blunt, it is bleak and I don't necessarily know how to fix it. Well, I'm going to open up our vision statement and with all this kind of lingering in the background, Let's just look at our vision statement with uh, new eyes. By the way, nice email about finding primary, secondary, and tertiary. I was I hoping that would help. Yeah. I like that. I, I really wanted to encourage people to actually do this. And so I thought, well, providing an instructional email would be oh, yeah. a, a help. All right. So the statement says, positive perspectives exists to encourage delight in thought through the generation of positive perspectives so that the sciences, aesthetics, and practices of mankind might mold themselves to the workings of logos. That right there will not happen without conversation. I think we've already established at least that point. And it might be we have. literal conversation or it might be I mean, some individuals actually said, I don't really know what you mean by logos, which, fair enough. Yeah. We, we do need to clarify. And that's the whole point of, of me suggesting our, our first series of episodes be uh, a series of episodes on these words, on, on what this value statement means. Hmm. Yeah, like we've got like to we, we will get there. It's establish like what this is and how it will happen. Yeah. Okay. So that that's good. We've got a we've got a mission statement, and we we have something that we're aiming at. Something is better than nothing, even if it's just a little tin can put two hundred yards down the range. At least it's a target. Yeah. We didn't necessarily have that. And Might have just thrown it together, but yeah. I think we all agree this Nobody is this, this is worth pursuing. Yeah. And there was something interesting you said, that everybody could pursue this in their own way. I agree with that, but part of me takes issue with it because there is some implicit direction as to the manner in which people pursue this in the framework of positive perspectives, which is that you have to be okay with thinking. You have to enjoy thinking. You have to be interested in sciences, aesthetics, and practices of mankind. And you have to be interested in logos. So there is an implicit idea in there. All of that's given, not, you yeah. know, the the simple blue collar approach. This is very much: Are you going to delight in rigorous study? It's true. I don't know. That's just the way it falls on my ears. Maybe that's not correct. Hmm. Hmm. I'm sure what I meant by in their own way was in relation to... Their communities, which is, that per, makes sense. Perhaps so, but also in relation to what sort of content or work towards content they will be pursuing for this, this okay. new, new phase. That of makes club. sense. So content that is interesting to them, so depression if was it's, something that was brought up. Yeah, so for instance, Mike... And it makes sense. Doesn't necessarily want to talk about metaphysical truth. Would rather talk about um, things that plague the human condition. Yeah. Very that, practical, tangible things. And those can still be studied in a rigorous, and so, rigorous way. And so, what I what I was trying to 
because I really think it's important to include individuals like him. Sure. This book club isn't a ivory tower philosophers. It's not necessarily that. It, we've of we've engaged in some of that activity uh, that is a bit tr- beyond the day to day, the mundane, in order to bring it back down to earth, in order to be um, just fundamentally more knowledgeable about the thoughts of mankind so that we can actually engage with every single possible ideological or worldview perspective. Okay, and I, I think Mike is definitely with us on that and that we we uh, are on the same page. I guess all the only point I was hitting is that yes, we can get in the dirt with real practical things, but the way we do that, this vision statement seems to imply that it has to be a rigorous, thoughtful digging, not just a, oh, I'll agree with thoughtful. One and done. Delighting in thought is certainly a part of that. And it's kind of how we do this podcast. We tend to leave a lingering thought question at the end of that podcast saying, you know, this is difficult. Let's engage in thinking with it. We're enjoying thinking and conversing about it. That's, that is right there at the heart of delighting in thought. Hmm. Here's something. Something that was kind of put up against this vision statement in the meeting was the idea, the the prescriptive way of dealing with human problems. Yeah. That you can prescribe an issue. Like I I have a very close person who's close to me who deals with some amount of anxiety and uh, fatigue and invasive thoughts in her life. And we had a really ongoing discussion because the thoughts looked something like very brutal death. You know, always death. And I'm like, that doesn't sound like anxiety to me. Because anxiety typically looks like you're wanting to solve a problem. Mm. You're not trusting your faith to solve it for you, so you sit and try to solve it. But this isn't you something, you doing something. This is something being done to you. Your mind is going down this path without you choosing to let it go there. So we had this ongoing discussion. If we hadn't had that discussion, I might have just shut her down right away and said, here's your prescriptive verse. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God. Whereas this was not her with pride and control and arrogance trying to control things. It was way deeper than that. So the reason I bring that up is just that how can we get in the dirt without just becoming prescriptive to very complex human problems? How can we be practical without just giving them their, their faith prescription and sending them on their way? So what you're describing is a goal for this new phase of the book club. And I don't know that I can just come up with an answer. I think we're, we're all communally hoping that that answer is present and partially my thought at least is that it will be present due to the plural nature of our, our teachings um, perspectives is plural positive perspectives Yeah. when we have these different angles coming from different experiences like I talked about before it's not that we come together and disagree about things. It's that we come together with these differing perspectives and find out that they're complementary. And because of that, we're going to be approaching problems and dirt problems like you described from a, hopefully a sufficient enough number of directions that our answers actually are, um, well, they're going to be intrinsically conversational because we have to converse, we have to navigate the differing perspectives. And we have to bring them together. So that's where this conversation comes in. Because of that, I really don't think we're going to have trouble with prescriptive answer. If one person tries and prescribes an answer from their perspective, the rest of the group is going to be like, okay, well, how does that fit into this and this and this and this? And suddenly you're instantaneously in a conversation. And rather the prescription than prescription is put into a difficult framework to play in because it was only one situation which you realized is more complicated. Yeah. Than you ever thought it was. And so even if, if, let's say, one of the members does come, perhaps they weren't delighting in thought in their preparation, and they just say, okay, you know, here's depression, here's the solution that I have. You should do this solution because it worked for me. 
the rest of the group is not going to be able to engage with that without that conversation coming out. And so that, that, that prescription will intrinsically be brought into a framework of conversation. And that's valuable because now that information goes beyond just them. Yeah. They maybe brought it from data to information and now it can be transferred into the group think of wisdom to where it can be applied in many different places. And another key part of what's made the book club great, I've kind of just realized this. Yeah. You know, I mentioned a couple of things before. A key part from the very beginning has been critical thinking and a critical thought question. I, I realized this when you said group think, because that is a, uh, I think it's a sociological term, yeah. referring to a group of people homogenizing their thoughts. Hmm. Um, they all come together and they tend to think similarly when they're all together. Yeah. And and there's various related, you know, ideas and theories around this. When we come together, we don't homogenize, or at least we try not to homogenize, Be- because we try to do critical thinking. It's in it's actually in opposition to that kind of okay. Let's just all agree. Critical intrinsically is a disagreeable idea. You know, it, it, it's a disagreeable concept. Uh, because of that, I'll just say, I think it's going to be very important that we do maintain that critical thinking when it comes to this next phase. Because yeah. that, we, we, you're right, we don't want a group think. That's the foundation of cognition going all the way back to Socrates. I mean, Voltaire, I think, said, you will know someone by the quality of their questions, not by the quality of the answers. I think delighting in thought is like a positive spin. <laughs> <laughs> on saying something along the lines of critical thinking and more. So I, sure. I think it's there in our mission statement. It's just something, it, it's one of those key components of that book club that we can't you know, overlook and, and forget about. Yeah, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, right away in the early days, people were pointing out how our language has changed, our uh, methods of conducting ourselves in the world have changed. Um, and you know, I'm at the point now where I can take this stuff and apply it in my classroom yeah. and spend 90 minute class periods discussing the word equity yeah. with students and the difference between equity and equality. Uh, and these are things I never would have been able to do and I tried to do in the early days of positive perspectives. I tried to have an ongoing discussion about the Notre Dame Cathedral burning down. That right. didn't really happen. It was kind of shut down. But now things are really clicking. Um, so. What I'm getting from this is that some of the presuppositions of positive perspectives are conversation. Perhaps the second presupposition is critical thinking, which is a product of conversation. And the third word that comes to mind is community, is that positive perspectives is a community. Yeah. And that we. There's at least two elements to that, right? There's this concept that we've all been friends, and we are friends, and many of us for a long time. Yeah. And because of that, we're, we're bound to each other in, in some way. Yeah. But there's also this concept of mutual respect. If someone does come into this club, and we've had new members, you know, rel- people who haven't been friends with us for so long, um, come in, we give them that communal honor. You know, they are equal part in that group in that community they with us. They can ask their critical thought question. We've, we've had a couple yeah. of um, meetings where, you know, individuals who, who literally just come one time have come and uh, we I, I think we've been very fair to them. They've had a very good, you know, respectful and community uh, driven meeting then. Absolutely. Yeah, there's some on there. I know Nathan showed up at one point. David showed up at one point. It was really good. And we had some other people as well. I think Kevin is one guy. Yeah. Uh, so we've got critical thought, conversation, community. And now it's almost like we have a fourth C that we're adding. Creation. And I really like that one. Yeah. And it's almost as if all of these build the next one. Critical thought probably is a better first one. Critical thought builds conversation. Yeah. Conversation builds community. I could see that. Community builds uh, creation. So I don't know. It's almost like all these things are dominoes in a chain. 
the only thing I see being a barrier and something that creates nihilism in positive perspectives is if we don't agree that thought is delightful and a gift from God, and if we don't agree that conversation can't fix any of the world's problems. Uh, so back to that, yeah. So you you effectively started this conversation by saying, hey, my engagement with philosophy even is a vice, yeah, but it's better vice. I'll, I will do that one instead of just the yeah, other any ones. Any of the other things that I can do, yeah. And I, I think... <laughs> I think the group, at least um, in their own ways, is, is in agreement with that, that yeah. it is a vice. And because of that, we certainly are going to have some kind of problem with some individuals not wanting to actually engage in that. Now, I think it's a creative, I think it's good. You know, I could say a whole bunch of things about it, but that wouldn't necessarily change that implicit, uh, intrinsic bias. concept that this is actually a vice. You know, we have encountered this since the very beginning of our book club. We invited one member to the book club who said, no, that's a bad idea. You guys shouldn't be, I, I'm not going to be engaging in philosophical, you know, conversations with you guys, or philosophical uh, readings with you guys, because, you know, we, we don't need that philosophy. We have a Christian philosophy. It's better. Yeah. Wow. So, and it's the same thing, right? It's and That's the big thing is how do you... This is almost a deeper wing of the prescriptive thing we discussed earlier. Is that that's a thing that needs to be answered for more um, common ideas to be held, for yeah. more agreement to be built. So I think, how do you answer that? I don't think you and I agree with that. No, we don't. But um, how do we answer? It? You know, my answer was the, was the book club pitch in the first place. Hey, listen, we need to understand the thoughts of man in order to act. Like personally, it, it's a fulfilling thing to to be able to look at anyone listen to them a bit and say, oh, I've encountered that sort of thinking before, and maybe it's not even explicit in my mind, you know, maybe it's not, oh, this was a, you know, a, a stoicism uh, thing. Maybe it's not even that clear, but when I listen to people, it's like, I can relate, I can understand, I can be sympathetic, empathetic, even. Hmm. So the response of the person... That's my response to it. Yeah. If we don't engage with all these different thoughts, then we're failing to engage with the world sufficiently. Hmm. The counter-argument might be, think not of what you will say, for God will give you wisdom in the time when you need to speak. You know, it's like a book quote in Acts. Uh, let's get the actual quote. <clears throat> and of course I'm not agreeing with this, but I'm going to share it. <laughs> But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say. Yeah. So there's that idea. That, that, that if, if they were to quote that back to me in that context, that conversation, I, I think I'd be, I mean, it's almost a trope, but I think I would be justified to say that is taken out of context. This is not uh, applicable to the entire uh, Christian condition in Christian life. And God, Christian communication God is not actually instructing us to remain dumb and not prepare and not like, would you not prepare for a sermon? Would you not prepare before you go out and evangelize with a specific group of people? You know, if you're going to go out on a missions field, are you not going to maybe do a little research on who you're going to maybe meet like, with and how they the, live and what, what they the think? What do the Abyssinians believe? <laughs> what do the Algerians believe? And so our engaging in philosophy from this Christian perspective, at the very least, is saying, what does the entire world think? And maybe it is a base level thing, but it's working. It's working for us. Absolutely. So we, we are able to have these deep conversations in our classrooms now. Of course. And there's extra arguments that they might bring to bear. Uh, so then they leave aside the biblical route and they just say, well, all they need to hear is the Bible. That's all they need to hear. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you say to that? This is a pretty common argument as well. Um, people who do not believe the Bible don't want to hear the Bible. And this is a, a point of contention, a point of much discussion when it comes to evangelism and evangelizing in different contexts. While it may be true if you go to, let's say, France and talk on the street with people there, 
that sharing a Bible verse, sharing the Bible with someone could influence them in one way or another. Granted, they've never heard the Bible before, so maybe that is helpful. However, it's also true that whoever you talk to there is almost certainly going to hate the Bible. They're going to hear you quoting the Bible and have a vitriolic response, an emotional vitriolic response to that. Disgust. Yes. <laughs> As an evangelist, I personally would like to avoid those responses um, in, in those I'm trying to reach. I don't necessarily want to intentionally evoke that. And so a way around that is perhaps using a slightly different method of engaging with their mind, engaging with their preconceptions of God, their philosophy, their worldview, and bringing in a witness of what who God is, who Christ is, where to be witnesses, what the Bible says through myself, through my own witness, because they aren't having a vitriolic, hateful, uh, disgusted response to me. They're having it because of their preconceived notions of what the Bible is and what religion is. You know, you could really, if you want to level a full broadside to this and then swing back around and level another full broadside, you know, I love just, you know, obliterating the competition. So I was going to say, was one not enough? <laughs> one was definitely not. Okay. How, how big is this boat? <laughs> <laughs> this is a ship of the line. Oh. Okay, so then you take the other thing. Paul, he speaks to the Athenians. Yeah. He starts with their experience. Right. He starts with their culture. You have a statue to the unknown God. Let's say he'd not been paying attention. He'd not seen that. And he just started with Romans 1. Yeah. You know the eternal attributes of God. You're all going to hell. <laughs> he didn't choose to do that. Right. He didn't start with Romans 1, 2, and 3. He started with this unknown God you speak of is this. So that that's one broadside. The other one is the words of Christ. Sometimes Christ doesn't share the gospel. He refuses to speak. Yeah. Sometimes he talks to people with just questions. Sometimes he just tells cryptic little stories. Yeah. Uh, so, in some ways, he's the quintessential troll. Bless his name. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I see Christ and I see intellectual work going on there. I see this amazing intellectual, philosophical engagement, all of the wisdom of Solomon and infinitely more in what he's doing. And, you know, it's not just a simple John the Baptist repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Yeah. Uh, and we're called to not walk in the way of John the Baptist, we're called to walk in the way of Christ. So, you know, this is all very religious, and I know we're in a philo philosophy podcast, but here's the deal. Positive Perspectives was founded on some ideals. Those ideals have certain attacks that are leveled against them, and I think they need to be addressed. So, that's my, my address to it, is the broad side of the person of Paul speaking philosophically to the Athenians on their level, and the person of Christ who uses all manner of tools, not just the Torah, you know, all manner of tactics and ways. I think that's fair. I think that's really fair. I mean, of course I do, but... <laughs> um... Yeah, yeah, there's probably other examples too. I mean, like the the response, the response from these individuals who don't want to engage with this stuff because it's, you know, tainted or whatever it may be, is is just it's putting their heads in the sand. It's it's hiding. It's running. It's it's not. There's nothing Christian about it. It's isolationist. You know. So, just to be really blunt about it, they don't have a leg to stand on when it comes down to it. And, and I've always said that. I think we've articulated the various reasons why that's true pretty well at this point. Yeah. Well, you and I obviously have successfully group thought. <laughs> so now my next question to you. How do you see this lesson plan format? <laughs> yes, that's really what you wanted to talk about, I know. <laughs> How the heck is that going to work? Who is our audience? Is the book club itself almost like audience 1.0 and then we draw a circle out from them and the whole internet or YouTube is the next level of the audience? Who are the students? Can anybody who's not presenting at any given time also be considered a student? Like, what do we, what do we think of? Yes, 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 and I yes. I saw you just look at your watch. It's hilarious because we've I, not even started on the stuff we planned. It, it was... <laughs> 
my light was blinking. I just thought I would check. Let the it phone. be known, folks who are listening at home, this was not even a planned discussion. We have like I have like twelve. We have seven events. other planned discussions for today. This was not one of them. <laughs> So, this is exciting. Yeah, we're going to have a good day. It's going to be gonna good. Have a really okay. good day anyway, until 8.30 p.m. Anyway, as you were saying. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, lesson plan. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. I think uh, the, the way, the optimal way to view it is perhaps, you know, I just, I've suggested so many things here, and in a way, we kind of are doing that groupthink thing where that first idea is, is ruminated on, and it seems good to the group, so we just kind of move forward with that. Okay. Um so I'm a little concerned. I would like some more input from the others in the group when it does come to this lesson planning stuff. And that being said, I don't disagree with myself. That would be a lunacidal, lunatical, lunatical. <laughs> We're gonna go with that. <laughs> oh, we are Shakespeare, oh, y'all. Making up words, it's good. Um, <laughs> lunacy, that's probably right. Anyways. Um, lunacy. <laughs> so I don't disagree with myself. I think that what I have proposed is a working model. I think it's something that, that would work. It, it, we could make it work. As far as the audience is concerned, it's probably optimal to consider our group, the other members of the group, each an audience member from your own perspective. Yeah. And what we're gonna do if we, if we well, what's good about that is basically that we will have a clear idea of who we're presenting to and thereby have a better informed lesson. We're not throwing out this mm. massively broad net like the public education system yeah. may do and try and you know dumb it down to where a two-year-old can understand it everyone can pass yeah we're not doing that we're saying okay you know jacob to brandon here here's some interesting things that you know i can i can tailor to you and jacob to jonathan here okay jonathan like you know here's some interesting things and and so when i have this set group of individuals who i'm talking to it's actually better for conversation who would oh, yeah. have guessed so an example would be you decide to teach a six-week lesson on logic and the processes thereof. Not an example, no. That's not uh, an example. That is not what I ever had in mind. Really? I actually I want to take this group teaching idea to heart. Uh, I think that every uh, episode we do is taught by everyone to everyone else. Oh, wow. And so every individual of the group is contributing to this episode, to that lesson. Hmm. That's what I really have in mind, and I believe it enough to where I'll, I'll push for it at least a bit. Um, I mean, that's on uh, John Hattie's framework that I showed you. Yeah. Reciprocal teaching is right. very high up there on the list of effectiveness. Yes, so what this will do is bring everyone to that conversation, everyone to that lesson, very, very prepared. Mm. And it will make, it, hopefully, it will make our conversations immensely fruitful. Because then they're not a vessel to be filled. Yes. They have to You're see themselves already. as a flint ready to light the fire of everyone else. Right. So that completely sets the standard so high that there's no room for anybody to show up and be lackadaisical. Absolutely. Uh, no room at all. Now, I'm not sure what it's going to look like practically because I thought the logic class example... I mean, we could still do logic. I would love to study that, but... Yeah. I guess I'm just not sure of what the meeting structure will look like now that everyone's ready to teach. Right. And, and we can talk about that too. So we're moving from a book club where we had one leader and everyone else might have contributed a little bit. And it's a might have because for the most part we never really did bring pre-thought out critical thinking questions like the original model suggested. Hmm. Um, we're moving away from that and we're saying, okay, everyone is coming as co-leaders and maybe we do delegate one as the planner. Kind of like we have for this month, we've said, okay, Brandon, hey, you've had some experience in teaching. Could you put together a lesson plan for us? Let's, sure. Uh, so maybe there is a facilitator slash leader and everyone else is just leader, mm. something like that. Sure. Um, but that's that's really what I have in mind. And so... I could be about that. I could totally see it, it being effective. It brings that bar way up, like, like we talked about, to where now everyone basically has to come with... Um, some content prepared and this is where we get into how the actual meeting flows because what i actually have in mind is giving everyone a chance to present whatever they may want to in whatever format they may want to maybe they came with a pre-recorded video of themselves of someone else of a lecture and they present that and they say hey this is the material i want to present i think this is very pertinent to our topic and then the next person goes and the next person goes and the next person goes 
And maybe there's a time for response in between each one, or maybe there's not for sake of time. Maybe we wait till everyone's concluded and have a group absolute free form discussion time. This is something we've not done in the book club, partially because it was always, there was always a singular uh, topic. Okay, so uh, there was the monologue, and so anyone could respond to that monologue. That's important, but that, that, that was the topic being discussed. Or there was a critical thinking question. Anyone can respond to that critical thinking question. That's the topic being discussed. Mm -hmm. And that order certainly has value and use. I'm thinking now, let's remove extraneous structure, which is another mm -hmm. thing we'll talk about in one of the episodes today. Nice. And, and let's see, because we're all coming as full vessels, let's see how this discussion will flow amongst us since we all have come with prepared content. And there's no longer that singular topic, uh, or that singular subtopic, I should say, to discuss. Now we're just all coming and discussing about the actual you know, episode title level big idea Okay. after we've all presented our, our pertinent materials. And whatever might be a wing topic to that. Yes, so Constant. I'm seeing this as a relatively long meeting. Yeah. We, we each do... Yeah, we've had some long... Presentations, <laughs> monologues. These, these could be all day meetings. Like, I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. That's long form podcasting. <laughs> and then we, we have this really long discussion where we maybe do go off on tangents and all that. And then what I'm thinking in terms of the actual content we produce, and this is maybe a separate stage, because th these meetings will be immensely helpful for us personally. Yeah. I mean... Oh my goodness, we're just going to learn so much about whatever we do, you know? Yeah, absolutely, because everybody's <laughs> There's no the way around that. At a different point. Yeah. Covering more ground. After the meeting, there's an editing phase. And okay. I think, I think we do a couple things here. Maybe we do produce a full, full on, long form podcast where we have five hour episodes, even, if, if we go that long. We can just publish the whole thing and put it as a video as well if we have yeah. recording. But then additionally, I'm thinking we edit it down into a bite size, you know, YouTube-esque video of some feasible length. And that could be an hour, that could be, that could be 10 minutes. The four presentations that maybe lasted 30 minutes or something. It could be, it could be portions of the presentations plus a bit of the conversation. It could sure. be whatever... Really the editor slash the group direction. agrees on. It could mm -hmm. go any direction. The point is for this one in particular, though, to be of a, a higher quality, of a high, a, a highish quality to, to counter the, not to counter, but of a quality like, you know, this, uh, like you'd see from other producers. Song oh no. From Handel's Messiah. Will called you sing? Refiner's Fire. Ah. And he shall come to his temple <laughs> and be a refiner's fire. This will be a refiner's fire. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whoever has control over the editing effectively is taking responsibility for for that whole project. But even that's even what I see. Broader than that, like just this entire method methodology we're changing is going to be a refiner's fire. But I like it because it's in line with the realization I had last night at midnight that I have chosen my vice. Mm. <laughs> so. Now's the time to dig the hole. Yeah. Might as well. All right, well, this has been very informational for Hopefully me. that's favorable to you. I know it's a little bit It's very favorable. I just need to, to know more explain. detail yeah. what it would look like. That's what I have in my head. Okay, um, I'm, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. This is good. The reason I couldn't get that in the meeting then was because we were more talking about pie in the sky vision, stuff like that. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, well, Positive Perspectives has... Been around for about two years now, folks, since 2018. We've gone through many permutations since then. Um, if you wish to join us, you can go to our website and find the book club tab. And that email is still good to my knowledge. You can yep. email and reach out and join us. This is very much not just for us. Uh, anyone's welcome. This is for the world and anybody who delights in thought. So this has been the Narratives and Philosophy Podcast, signing off.